Hello and welcome to the Ohio Health EMS Grand Round Series. My name is Eric Cortez and I serve as the System EMS Medical Director for Ohio Health. Our topic today is on geriatrics and I'm joined by my friend and colleague, Dr. Bridget Anders. Dr. Anders, thank you for being with us today. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we're really excited to talk about geriatrics with you. For our audience, Dr. Anders is one of our emergency physicians with Ohio Health. She's one of our faculty members with Ohio Health Doctors Hospital, and she is our expert in geriatrics and also event medicine. So uh, we're gonna be discussing geriatrics today, and we have at least three or four separate topics that we'd like to cover. Uh, and we're gonna get right into it, Dr. Dr. Anders. Um, let's say that our EMS agencies, let's say that some of our, our personnel get called on an elderly person, uh, let's say it's a 75 year old female uh, that is a lift assist and needs help getting up from the floor back onto her bed. Um, this is a run that has a lot of different challenges. There's a lot of things to consider by our EMS personnel when they're on scene. Can you start by talking about geriatric in general and the geriatric population and how that affects our EMS systems and our EMS agencies. Absolutely. So I think, you know, I think we all have seen that the geriatric population is a high utilizer of EMS. Um, and what's really interesting is in our population, that's only expected to grow. So the, the geriatric population um, by 2050 is expected to make up one fifth of the total population. So a fifth of the total population is going to be over the age of 65. Um, you know, in the next 20 to 30 years. So I think, you know, the, the first thing is that we know that geriatrics utilize EMS at a, at a higher rate um, and there's just going to be more of them. And so I think the first thing is just kind of recognizing that these runs are going to continue to happen and, and probably increase um, just as that population grows. Um, and you know, I think the list, the lift assist call is is a is a unique call um, because there are kind of a lot of things that have to be taken into account when on scene. Just as far as you know, sometimes the call comes in and it's just a lift assist. I just need help back to my bed. I don't need anything else. Um, but you know, EMS is is the eyes on scene, and sometimes you know you show up to that home and you know, I just need help back to bed might mean that, you know, did they fall two days ago and they just were able to get to the phone, um, you know, now, um, did they fall because they're altered or they're so weak that when you get them back to bed, is that where they're going to have to stay until someone else is there to help them? Um, is their home, you know, did they fall because of something within their home that's unsafe um, and is, I think, you know, you're kind of faced with the question of is just getting them back to bed going to fix the problem um, or is there more going on here that we need to kind of assess and, you know, I think, can does every lift assist, do we need to take transport every list, lift assist? Like, no, but are there lift assist calls that probably just putting them back in their chair back in bed is is only going to lead to another call you know um or you know deterioration or you know do they need something something beyond that lift assist even though that's what the initial call was for yeah you bring up a, a, a lot of good points um and i would like to highlight some of those but the first question i have for you is you know for our listeners who's geriatric is it 55, 65, 70, 75, how do you categorize who's a geriatric patient? Yeah, so I think this is kind of evolving, right? As our population evolves, I think um, it's it's been defined in the literature at, at 65 um, for a while, but I think we're all well aware that there are 55 year olds um, with, you know, a laundry list of chronic medical conditions who probably are going to, you know, be more similar to a 75 year old than some of our 65 year olds. Right. And so I think it's it's 
I think we want it to be black and white. We want it to be a bucket that, or a checkbox, like, okay, they're geriatric. And so now I'm going to go down this pathway and consider these different things. But I think it's, it's probably way more of a gradient and way more of, you know, do, you know, your chronic medical conditions make you, you know, a little closer to geriatrics than just your age. Um, you know, we've all seen the, you know, lives alone, goes on a five mile walk every morning, 75 year old lady who, you know, is takes, you know, a baby aspirin every day and has never had a medical condition in her life. Um, and we've also seen the the 45 year old who needs a duffel bag just to, to bring his medications into, into the ER with him. Um, so, you know, one of those by age definition falls into geriatrics, but I think we would all we would all agree that, you know, the way you think about that 45 year old isn't probably the same way you think about a healthy 45 year old with no medical problems. Yeah, there's, there's, there's the chronological age that's a, a part of determining who's geriatric, but part of it is actual age and in medical comorbidities, as well as social determinants of health. And it seems like for different types of disease processes, there may be a different age cutoff. For example, some of the medicine is 65. Uh, some of the trauma data suggests 55. Some, su some suggest 70. And I think a lot of that is extrapolated over from risk stratification tools and so forth. But you bring up a really good point that, you know, who's geriatric and, and who we treat as that special population of geriatrics, uh, there's a lot of factors that go into determining which patients are actually geriatric. So thank you for highlighting that. Um, in your initial discussion of, of that case that we ran on, the older person that needs uh, a lift assist, you began to mention some of the different uh, services that that patient may need. So classically always consider, you know, the 911 response as the emergency response. So I think we all go in there and we have a checklist of possible medical emergencies or traumatic emergencies that we may be encountering. But um, when it comes to overall geriatric health uh, of the individual, uh, what other factors could they be calling for? And when we walk into the scene, what are we looking for for clues in the house that may indicate this patient needs some social services or maybe um, some food assistance or maybe needs transportation help? Can you help elucidate that for our, for our listeners? Yeah, I think, you know, a lot of it is, is you know, like you said, kind of just taking a look around and figuring out, you know, are there, you know, are the medications everywhere and unorganized? And, you know, when you take a look at it, it's pretty clear that, that there's, you know, a very unlikely chance those are being taken regularly or correctly. Um, you know, is it, you know, taking a look in the kitchen and noticing that doesn't look like, you know, can the patient even get to their kitchen from where they are? Um, you know, sometimes they might have some resources, like maybe someone shops for them or someone does something, but they're not able to then prepare that food themselves. You know, if they're unable to stand in their kitchen and, you know, even something that we would consider somewhat simple, like opening the refrigerator and taking things out of there and getting them to where they need to cook them, um, you know, kind of figuring out, can this patient do that? Um, and you know, maybe five years ago when these resources, you know, started being utilized for this patient, they were able to ambulate a lot better. And so just having someone get their groceries for them was enough. Um, and maybe now that that isn't enough. Um, and so just kind of, I think, you know, a lot of it is, is just taking a look around the home and figuring out, you know, it, it can be pretty obvious if, you know, that the patient, you know, has, you know, maybe goes from the chair to the bed to the bathroom. And that's the only place that they are. I think the other thing is, you know, we have so many patients um, at, on home oxygen, do they even have enough oxygen tubing to get to the other places in their home? Um, you know, a lot of people have, you know, they've got feet and feet of tubing, and it's probably more of a fall hazard because of how much tubing they have. But there are other people <laughs> maybe go home and, and don't have enough to get to some of the places within their home that 
you know, they need to get to. Um, or maybe they used to be able to kind of move their, you know, their portable concentrator with them. And so they only had so much tubing and, and now they, they can't, you know, carry that. That's something they can no longer do. Um, so I think just kind of taking a broader look at the home in general and, you know, what lapses are you seeing in what, you know, in what that patient can, can do. Yeah, so many good points there, Dr. Anders. Um, you know, probably for the remainder of this talk, we'll be focusing on some of the emergencies that we encounter in geriatrics. But um, all those points that you just said are, are, are critical for EMS to note and to document and to relate to the hospital staff. None of us that work within the four walls of the hospital have the ability to see the home environment and to see all the different factors that go into affecting the health of the patient that we're taking care of. You know, if, if you put on your public health hat for a second, there's always the individual, then there's the environment, and then there's the mechanism of, of the disease or the, or the trauma or whatever topic we are discussing. And unfortunately, when we see patients in the ER or in the hospital, we don't get to see their home environment. We don't get to see their social support, their family support, um, all, of the, all of the peripheral factors that go into influencing access to health care and compliance with health care. Uh, so great job at elucidating all those points. Uh, and just, you know, some advice for our EMS providers when you walk into the room, you know, just take a mental picture about what you're seeing, just like Dr. Anders uh, pointed out. And that can be very impactful to both short-term and long-term yeah. care for our patients. Um, with that, I would like to transition to a second case, if that's all right with you. Right. Um, I want to talk about some geriatric trauma now. You know, geriatric trauma, it's nice because we got a decent evidence base on this topic. So let's say that our, our providers go on a 72-year-old um, male uh, with a, a fall from standing. Uh, vital signs are otherwise okay except for a GCS of 13 and you maybe got an abrasion or a hematoma on the forehead. So what are you thinking about from a clinical standpoint on scene? Uh, and then can you get into some triage and transport decisions with uh, geriatric trauma patients too? Yeah, so like you said, I, I do think this is, this is an area that we do have some data on, which is nice. Cause I think, you know, a lot of geriatric data is sometimes more elusive and hard to get kind of hard facts on. and and luckily some of the trauma registries have really provided some some good data for us to be able to kind of develop evidence-based protocols in our geriatric populations in regards to trauma um i think in this case right so we've got a ground level fall um which i think a lot of times we would say like pretty low mechanism right um but i think the things that change that right are the patient's age you said there's an abrasion and maybe hematoma on the forehead so you know these we have to kind of take into account is if you had i mean even a 20 year old who stumbled and fell they're probably just going to like get up and go about their day right um it's probably going to take a pretty decent fall or maybe some you know co-factors like intoxication or other things like that for that to actually even get called in right that's not like everybody has tripped and fell and we don't always call ems for that right um but I think, you know, you have to take into account with this, the geriatric population, um, you know, obviously there was head trauma here. Um, and a lot of times the geriatric population is just that increased risk of head trauma um, from these falls. Um, they have, you know, slower reaction times. They have less, you know, proprioception and, and ability to, you know, in the younger, you know, in kids, why do kids break their arm every time they fall, right? Because they they stick their hands out so that they don't hit their head. Um, and a lot of times for whatever reason in, in the geriatric population, whether that's something physical or, you know, was this patient altered when they fell and they weren't even able to kind of prepare to fall and try to put their arms in front of their head or their face. Um, so I think just kind of in your initial assessment of this patient, you you already have evidence of head trauma, which I, you know, in a low mechanism fall, we don't always see. So there's already kind of some red flags as far as probably some complicating factors. Um, 
I think, you know, the other thing that you, you said is GCS of 13. Um, and I, I think, you know, it's easy when we, you know, take the test or read the book, right? Oh, GCS of 13. That's not great. That's going to be head trauma. This, this patient was what in their seventies is GCS of 13 their, their baseline, right? Like that's what complicates this, right? Like maybe GCS of 13 is, is where this patient lives, right? And they're actually at baseline. Um, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't take that, you know, GCS seriously, but I think it just complicates things, right? Um, or family tells us, oh, he's got a history of dementia. He's got a history of whatever. Well, what does that mean? You know, there's people with a history of dementia who like still, you know, do their own, they're able to still manage their household and do their own, you know, pay their bills every month. And, and there's other people with dementia who, you know, GCS of 13 will probably be a good day. Right. Um, and so I think in this population, you know, they're, they're at increased risk for, you know, high, you know, traumatic injuries kind of that, that are worse than we would expect with the mechanism. And then it's also their exam is just more difficult, especially their mental status exam. Um, you know, can, was his GCS a 13 because he didn't have his hearing aids in and he just couldn't hear you? Um, was it, you know, and so all these things just make, you know, your initial assessment, you know, so much more difficult than, you know, a motor vehicle accident with a 25 year old, right? Like 25 year olds GCS is 13. It's like, that's probably because of the trauma, right? Um, this guy's got evidence of head trauma, so his GCS of 13 totally could be because of his trauma. And that's probably, you know, what we should assume, but it's it's definitely so much more gray um, and so much more complicated than, you know, we'd, we'd all like it to be, I think. Yeah, we, certainly with these, um, you know, the special populations that we talk about, and especially geriatrics, uh, you know, the the art of medicine or the art of EMS uh, is probably e equally as important as the science of emergency medical services as well, uh, for all those reasons that you just highlighted. And um, basically what I'm hearing from you is there are anatomical and physiologic changes that are normal with the aging process that uh, can affect our assessment and our treatment and our medical decision making as well. Can you give some examples? Um, because I'm thinking of the uh, triage, uh, you know, one of the most important things that we do on scene with trauma is triage and make transport decisions about who needs to go to a trauma center or who can go to a non uh, a non trauma center when appropriate. And we typically will break that down into physiologic criteria, anatomic criteria, and then mechanism criteria. Um, can you just comment further on how as we age and we have older patients, how that affects their physiology, how that affects their anatomy and how that can affect our trauma triage in geriatric folks. Yeah, so I think, you know, as a population, you know, as we age, things just change physiologically, both, you know, just independently kind of as we age, but also I think the, the other big, big component of things that change physiologically is we're on way more medicines as we age, um, which also alter our physiology. Um, so some of the kind of basic things that we might look for in triaging from a physiologic standpoint, you know, are they tachycardic? Um, that's really hard to determine if they're paced at 65, right? Like they're, they're not gonna be tachycardic, even if they're, you know, bleeding into, into their thigh and they've, they've lost a significant amount of blood. Um, you know, the majority of these patients are on beta blockers, right? So tachycardia just in and of itself is an important thing that we have to take into account in these patients. Um, but it just might not be super helpful in the geriatric population. Um, we might not be able to just take it at face value. Um, I think from a head trauma standpoint, there's been some pretty impressive data that's come out. I think we've you know, for a while now, we've we've been pretty good about getting good history as far as being on blood thinners um, in the setting of of head trauma and even just falls in general in the geriatric population. 
Um, but there's been some papers kind of that have come out in the last couple of years that say, you know, the geriatric population at general, in general, without blood thinners on board, still have a higher propensity of head bleeds from low mechanism falls. So are blood thinners an important thing to take into account? Absolutely. Um, but just because they're not on a blood thinner probably isn't good enough to not be worried about head trauma in these patients. Um, as far as why that is, you know, you just get some atrophy, you get some shrinking of the brain, there's more space in there for it to jostle around. Um, you get kind of just weaker blood vessels in general um, that are being stretched a little differently. Um, and, you know, what, what your body used to just be able to absorb um, from a mechanism standpoint, um, now is enough to, to cause some pretty significant um, head trauma. I think, you know, the other thing, you know, you, you asked about was, was mechanism. Um, and I think we are, we're really good at, at defining, you know, high risk mechanism for the general population. But I think geriatrics, I think, you know, if, if you've been in EMS long enough and, or in medicine in general, you've seen the, I slid out of my chair, right? Not even a fall. They don't even want to call it a fall. And they've got, you know, broken ribs, a broken hip and a head bleed, right? Um, <laughs> and and I, this population, there's, there's, you know, I, I almost feel like it's this population, it's every mechanism, you know, could probably be enough, um, which, which makes it hard, right? Because Again, are you going to scan from head to toe every 75-year-old who, you know, rolls, you know, on the floor weird or something? Probably not, right? That's, you know, are you going to transport them to a trauma center as a level one trauma every time? Probably not, right? That's not necessarily the right answer is just to not, you know, but I think we do have to just have, I, I think it's more of your spidey sense has to be up in these patients because, they they don't follow the rules and they it just doesn't take quite as much to kind of have some some pretty impressive injuries um and so i think that just makes this population just super complicated again and you know also though i think provides you know an opportunity for ems to to really kind of embrace that this population is different and start to develop you know a skill set and and protocols and things that that do treat this population different and and allow us to to care for this population in a in a in a more holistic way and maybe in a, a way that's more appropriate you know that the 75 year old trauma run for ems probably should look different than the 20, 25 year old trauma run and and i think you know, just, you know, for our listeners, like being willing to learn about this population is going to make you a better provider. Um, and it's, it's going to help your patients ultimately. There's a whole bunch of good points that you just mentioned there, Dr. Anders. Um, a few comments, um, you know, number one is I want to refer our listeners to the state of Ohio trauma triage guidelines, as well as your local guidelines as well. Um, we really don't want to talk about the specifics of uh, those guidelines, but note that they are uh, different for the geriatric population. And there's a reason for that. Those, those, those uh, criteria have been associated with a higher risk of injury and injuries that require intervention. And they're a great tool to help you on scene uh, determine who needs to go to a trauma center or not. Uh, I would argue that an equally as important decision is getting the patient evaluated. Um, Dr. Andrews, you mentioned, you, you know, typically in the ER, we have a lower threshold for working up and imaging and evaluating geriatric trauma, whether that's x-rays or CAT scans or blood work or whatever we're talking about. And that's not directly applicable to EMS, um, but just having a general understanding that, you know, we're going to be pretty conservative with, with these patients in our workup because they have atypical presentations and their vital signs can be blunted by chronic medical conditions and medications and so forth. Uh, so just being extra careful with the geriatric population and um, 
yeah, really just treating them as a unique special population that requires a different approach than we do for our adult population. Uh, the spidey sense that you said, that's very important. Uh, and sometimes our, tri our triage criteria are, are going to help us pick that up. Sometimes it's all these different factors of the scene and the environment and the home and the family dynamics that are going to say, you know what, let's just take you in to get checked out rather than keeping you on scene. Um, and then the last point I want to point out is there are hospitals and ERs that are specializing in uh, geriatrics and becoming geriatric certified, whether it's a trauma service or an ER and so forth. And I think that goes to your point about uh, medicines evolving. The geriatric population is only going to get larger. The problem is not going to go away. And um, we as EMS providers and personnel and as a specialty um, need to be ready to take care of, of um, the expanding geriatric population. So excellent review on trauma. Uh, in the geriatric uh, population. Um, several minutes back, you mentioned, um, you know, how do you know what the GCS is of somebody that has dementia? So uh, the next topic that I want to talk to you about is this whole concept of dementia versus delirium and what this means for EMS. So, you know, let's say that we go on a run and it's a 67-year-old uh, that has a history of dementia that family tells you, but is acting just different and strange for the past two days. Uh, and really, um, two days ago was acting at baseline, and then uh, ha the behavior has really changed. He's not sleeping at night. His patterns seem to be reversed. And you're on scene it, and you're wondering, well, is this just the chronic dementia that's worsening, or is this a delirium? Is there an acute medical process that's going on? How do you work through those kind of patient encounters? Yeah, so I think those are those are complicated, right? Um, and I think the first thing is just having, you know, in your mind a pretty decent understanding of the basic differences. So dementia is going to be, you know, it's going to be chronic. It's going to be evolving and worsening, right? But over a time course of months to years to decades, um, and delirium is going to be much more acute. So that's going to be more of an acute change. You can get a lot more waxing and waning a lot of times in delirium. So moments where they seem totally at baseline and other moments where they are just totally not themselves, whether that's, I think the other thing is, you know, having a patient described as, you know, not themselves or altered, that can mean a whole host of things. So getting really kind of getting that information from family can be helpful. Sometimes to family, that means, like you said, not sleeping. Seems like everything is reversed now. Sometimes that means, you know, you know, our mom is, is talking to a cat that doesn't exist. You know, she's, she's now started talking to this cat that hasn't been in our house in 25 years. Um, and so, you know, it's hallucinations. Sometimes it's just, you know, confusion to the point of not being able to do the things they normally do, you know, not getting out of bed, not taking care of themselves. Um, and so I think, you know, having just a, a kind of a way in your mind that you kind of differentiate between those two, um, just at a basic level, thinking of dementia as, as kind of a more chronic, slowly evolving disease and delirium is this more acute, um, usually caused by something medical um, or medications, things like that. Um, in this case, I think, you know, really the hardest patients to figure this out in, right, are the ones that have already checked the box of dementia. And now family is saying, but this is different. Um, and so I think there it becomes helpful to ask the family, okay, so two days ago, you said they were at baseline. What does that look like? Um, right? Because if family says, well, you know, they have dementia, but that really just means that, you know, they don't really manage their own bank account anymore. And we put all their pills in a, in a weekly pill box for them. And, but other than that, you know, goes about their daily life pretty, pretty well. Um, you know, there's other people with dementia who it looks a lot different and, and really getting a sense from family, if they're on scene or anyone else of what that baseline looks like. Um, and then getting some more information about what's been different in the last two days. And you think, you know, as, as an ER provider, a lot of times, 
you know, you, EMS on scene might have access to way more information, um, and that can be extremely helpful. Maybe not right now. We might not know. You know, you might not know on scene. Is this dementia? Is it delirium? Maybe I think it's delirium, but I'm really not sure. Um, and if that patient gets transported, and you're able to kind of relay some of the information you were able to obtain on scene, you know, if it is delirium and it's, you know, now it's being treated and the patient is improving, but they're not. A GCS of 15. Well, if, if we've gotten the information that, you know, they haven't been a GCS of 15 since 1982, that's super helpful, right? Like, if, if we continue to wait for them to have a GCS of 15, they're never going home. Um, and so I think, you know, that's, that's one thing that I think, you know, EMS providers can, can provide this wealth of information that will help the patient, you know, and the providers who are caring for that patient. Um, throughout kind of the course of, of this, this hospitalization, if that's what it is, or even just kind of evaluation. Yeah. yeah. Be, being able to not necessarily differentiate delirium versus dementia. That's really hard. Sometimes it takes, you know, hospitals days and sometimes weeks to figure that out, but uh, having an understanding that there is a difference uh, and oftentimes a delirium will represent an acute problem that is reversible that may need fixed is uh, very important for EMS to um, incorporate into their decision making. You know, sometimes I hear the terminology like hyperactive delirium versus hypoactive delirium. Uh, can you talk about that and the difference in how those patients will present? Yeah, so, you know, like I kind of touched on, delirium can look totally different for lots of different patients. And, and two of kind of the big categories, these hyperactive and hypoactive delirium, so hyperactive, I think, is more of del the delirium that we that we picture a lot of times. It's the patient who maybe can't sit still. Maybe they're hallucinating. They're, they're talking to you know the cat that's not there. They're picking up you know they're you know this is this is the patient who like you're gonna have to you know that great IV you got you're gonna have to wrap that whole thing in tegaderm because she's just gonna keep picking at it no matter how many times you tell like okay don't you know leave your IV alone. Um, and, you know, maybe they're talking about things that make no sense, uh, but they're kind of everything is amped up. They almost look manic at times. Um, and then you've got hypoactive delirium, which is kind of just the opposite of that. You can have people who just maybe stop talking. They're, they're verbal at baseline. They talk, converse normally, and now they're just staring at you. And maybe family says, like, they haven't said anything all day. They're just not talking. Um, maybe they're sleeping way more. Maybe they're just not going and doing the things they normally do. Um, it can almost look like a, you know, at its severe, severe forms, it can be almost like catatonic, kind of where they're just laying there, stuck there, not really, you know, they, they don't have a desire to do anything. Um, and, you know, those are both forms of delirium. So the same, you know, acute process that's likely caused by something acute medically that can be treated and reversed, um, but look totally different, right? You've got maybe a, a lady who hasn't got out of bed for three days and isn't talking to her family, contrasted with someone who they said, I can't get her to sleep or stop talking or stop, you know, picking at every, you know, scab on her body. Um, and so knowing that they can exist on that kind of massive spectrum of things that look totally different from each other, but are, you know, caused by, you know, potentially something very similar and reversible um, is important to, to realize because it's going to help you make decisions and, you know, pick up on that, you know, this like, oh, is grandma just depressed and sad for the last three days? um versus you know
interacting with you much or just may look a little slow or just not very responsive. Um, you, you know, there that, that can be an underlying sign of a of, of, uh, pretty big problem. Um, I'd like to transition into uh, the next topic, and I love the way that you put this when we were talking before we started this recording. You know, the, uh, the geriatric population, the atypical presentations of high risk problems. So that was a great way to say that the, uh, you know, and um, I, I want to get your take on that. There's a, there's a, there's a whole bunch of medical emergencies that um, that can occur in the geriatric population and uh, the comorbidities, the medications, uh, everything that goes into uh, into influencing this this higher risk patient population, and what makes it even harder is they don't present like you read in the textbook. They have atypical presentation. So, uh, can you walk us through that and how how you approach these for some high risk complaints? Yeah. So I think you know the the example that I think just is stuck in my head is, you know, hallucinations, right? Like you see, you get called for hallucinations. That can be like, like we just talked about, that could be delirium, right? Which means that could be pneumonia. That could be a urinary tract infection. That could be, you know, like dead gut. That's, you know, and so anything that's causing them infection in some capacity that then makes them delirious might present with, you know, hallucinations. And I think we would all, you know, agree that when I, you know, when, when you read the textbook, it's not like, okay, causes of hallucinations, like you should be worried about that their gut is ischemic, right? Um, and so that's easy to miss, right? Um, I think the other one that I think we're getting better on and we've we've gotten some some good data um, is cardiac stuff. So, you know, the 40 year old who's diaphoretic clutching their chest saying that they have crushing chest pain, everybody's going to get an EKG on that patient. Right. Um, and, and pick up the STEMI. But the 80 year old who is a little bit nauseous and maybe I, I just don't know, maybe it's constipation um but they've got a bunch of risk factors maybe they're hypertensive or they have a history of hypertension and diabetes and high cholesterol and you know they got a couple stents 20 years ago you know that one's easy to miss right that that one's like do you need some gas x like you know <laughs> do you need some pepto bismol um and i think you know we're getting more and more data that especially in our elderly females that you know cardiac ischemia is elusive and it can present as a lot of belly complaints, a lot of mild belly complaints, which is also, I think what makes it difficult and elusive is, you know, they look well, they're not diaphoretic, they're not clutching their chest, they're, they don't look like they're trying to die on you, like maybe that 40 year old looks like with his STEMI, but but they are trying to die on you. Um, and so I, I think, you know, a big thing is just having a really low threshold to get some of the, you know, what we would consider screening, you know, like it's big reward, it's an easy test, um, you know, getting an EKG in these patients or, um, you know, I think they just can be, elusive and they they don't present the way that I think we all wish they did right it'd be really nice if they if they presented with diaphoresis and crushing chest pain and you know but they don't and so having like we've kind of talked about just your your spidey sense has to say hey something's up with this and you know I'm gonna make the decision to investigate a little bit more than I would in a 35 year old, right? Because if a 35 year old calls you because they're a little bit nauseous and might be constipated, like that, I agree that, you know, maybe they have something going on, but maybe they just need some gas X. And, uh, but in a 75 year old, I think that decision looks a little bit, looks a little bit different. Yeah, it's, it's the generalized, nonspecific GI and neural symptoms that drive us nuts, right? Because <laughs> they can be nothing or they can be a life threatening emergency. 
And being able to tease that out is, is extremely difficult. Um, you, you know, it's nice when somebody with appendicitis presents with abdominal pain, somebody with a STEMI presents with chest pain and so forth. Um, but as you, uh, as you described so well, you know, when we get older, we tend to present, it seems like, with mild, nonspecific symptoms. And, uh, it, you know, having a low threshold for doing the, the high risk or the high reward, low, low risk tests uh, can be very beneficial in picking up some of these emergencies. And for EMS, it's, it's about keeping it simple. Get a full set of vital signs, utilize your untitled capnography. That's a great tool for picking up respiratory distress hypercapnia. There's some good data that, uh, that an end title less than 25 is a good marker for sepsis. Uh, it is, um, you know, it can be a marker for lactic acidosis, uh, and it can be a marker for, for low bicarb. All are suggestive of a shock state. Uh, and also glucose. Don't forget your point of care glucose. Sometimes elderly folks that are ill present with hypoglycemia or profound hyperglycemia. That can be a clue as well. Um, with these eight, eight, atypical presentations of very high-risk complaints. You mentioned a few times, Dr. Anders, um, you know, medications. And geriatric patients tend to be on a lot of medications that interact. Um, what advice do you have for EMS providers? Can you kind of go through why medications can become problematic in a geriatric patient and what are some things that we need to note on scene or relay to the hospital that can help management once the patient gets to the ED? Yeah, um, these patients are on a ton of medications, um, to to say the least. Um, and I think you know the first thing that I think is important is just asking these patients, you know, where are your medications, and can we bring them? Because these patients a lot of times see a lot of different doctors um, and maybe their cardiologist is in one health system and their pulmonologist is in another and their family practice doc is in another and you know electronic medical records are great and they've they've helped with kind of getting these accurate med lists and things like that but they're not perfect um, and so i think you know just being diligent, especially in the elderly population, because they are on so many medications and, you know, they, they often don't know what their medications are. Maybe family puts them in a pill, you know, thing for them, or maybe they do it themselves weekly, but, you know, they can't remember the, and, and I don't blame them, right? The long list of medications they're on and how, you know, what dose do they take? And, um, and so I think the first thing is just being aware that they're going to be, they're likely on multiple medications. So asking about it from the patients and then just trying to bring them or, you know, maybe the patient says, hey, I have an updated list. Okay, can we bring that with us when we transport? Or, you know, if they don't, just saying, where do you keep your medications? Can we bring them with us when we transport you um, to provide kind of an accurate list? Um, I think the other thing is kind of these, our medical care has become super subspecialized in some areas which is awesome and provides really great care, you know, for, you know, now this physician, you know, this patient might see a pulmonologist for their COPD because they've been hospitalized three times in the last year and qualified for, you know, specific COPD services. Um, but that might mean that their pulmonologist doesn't know exactly what their nephrologist put them on. And, you know, we also have a plethora of medications, um, you know, medicine has evolved and, you know, is constantly, you know, there's constantly new medications on the market to treat X, Y, and Z, which are really important for these patients. Um, but I think it can be important to realize that, you know, maybe they were started on one medication and then they got a little nauseous. So they're starting on a second medication to help their nausea. But what they didn't know was their nausea was actually from the first medication and now they're a little drowsy because of that nausea medicine. And so they start on a third medication to help with the drowsiness. And, and that's not EMS's role to, to tease out. But I think just realizing that, you know, this can be complicated and it can be a, this web of a lot of medications. Um, I mean, 
EMS, I mean, I'm sure, you know, our providers, you've, you've seen the, the bags that people carry their medications in. It's not just like, let me grab these two bottles. A lot of times it's like, okay, it's that duffel bag has all my medications in it. It's like, whew, that's a lot of medications. Um, and, you know, I, I think just knowing that these patients are on a lot of medications and these medications can cause side effects and they can also interact with each other. Um, I don't, I don't think it's EMS's job or role to, to tease out, you know, in the setting of the call, is this because of X, Y, or Z, but you do have the opportunity to, you know, maybe get information that's going to be helpful down, down the line that, you know, if they show up to the hospital without those medications, that information might never be gained during their hospitalization. If that patient lives alone, there's no one else to bring the medications. I, you know, our pharmacists are pretty awesome and can do some digging and figure this out sometimes, but, you know, people use multiple pharmacies, all those things kind of complicate things. So I think just knowing that their medication list or just bringing the medications themselves, um, that can be a super valuable thing that EMS on scene can provide and will impact that patient's care probably throughout their hospitalization. Yeah. And even if you can't take the medications with you to the hospital and if you're you know, if your EMS agency and your medical director are okay with it, use your tablet to take a picture and upload the medication bottles, the, the picture to uh, the PCR. And that can be extremely helpful just to get it documented as well. And one more follow-up comment to um, even at baseline, all these medications can be hard to take. Uh, and it takes a great deal of organization to know when and how many pills to take each day. Uh, so, so sometimes there can be inter inadvertent uh, overdoses. And some of these medications have very low um, toxic thresholds where if you just take one or two or three extra pills, you can become really sick from that. And then we talked about a lot of uh, chronic problems such as kidney disease or liver disease. And sometimes acute on chronic or chronic worsening uh, kidney disease can lead to accumulation of medications that at baseline are okay, but if the patient's a little dehydrated and then develops acute renal failure, well, that patient may be holding on to those medications longer and develop a toxicity because of that as well. It's it's an extremely complicated process to walk through, um, but in, extremely important to be able to get that piece of history uh, to the hospital. So great, great points on that, Dr. Anders. We have um, a few minutes left. I want to uh, leave it with you. Can can you just give us any take home points that you have on geriatrics for our EMS agencies and EMS providers? Um, I think the first thing first is just recognize and just recognize and respect that this population is different. Um, they, they don't read the textbook. They don't present, you know, the way that you wish they did. So um, just recognition and respect for the fact that they are a unique population and their approach to them needs to also be unique and it needs to be specialized. Um, I think the other thing is just, I guess, more of an empowerment that you are the eyes on scene. A lot of these elderly patients, you know, their whatever is going on um, is going to be impacted by or related to maybe their living situation or some of those kind of socioeconomic factors or medications at home, things that, you know, you are the only one who is going to see that and, and your ability to kind of take note on a, on a kind of bird's eye view of, of the living situation, or, you know, you showed up and all the medications were still in the pharmacy bag and said they were filled three weeks ago, but they haven't even come out of that white stapled bag yet. You know, like that's information that's going to be important and helpful and, and just kind of, I guess, more of an empowerment to, to EMS providers that, you know, you're just kind of looking around and taking things in on scene um, is important. And, you know, as, as an ER physician, something that I am so thankful for, because that information sometimes can be what totally changes kind of the direction that we head in our workups. Um, and then I think the last thing is is just a, 
a element of realizing this population is high utilizers of EMS and they're only be, gonna become, there's only gonna be more old people, um, more geriatrics in the next 30 years. So this is, this is an, important, an important population. Um, so I guess the la that last point would just be to encourage you to kind of continue to learn about and embrace kind of the medicine of, of this special population um, because your kind of ability to treat these patients and the way in which you treat these patients really does have the opportunity to impact the care these patients get and make, you know, really impactful, you know, you're making important decisions and this population is only going to become more common for who these runs are, are on. Excellent points and uh, three great take home points regarding geriatrics and e EMS. Um, so Dr. Anders, I want to thank you on behalf of Ohio Health EMS for joining us for this grand round series. This was excellent and we really enjoyed having you. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you. It's been awesome. And for our listeners, uh, as a reminder, please remember to go to our website, ohiohealthems.com, where you'll be able to uh, provide feedback to us as well as obtain uh, CE and other related items on the website. If you have any questions about any of that, or if you have questions about the content that we covered, please feel free to reach out to me. My email is eric.cortez at ohiohealth.com, and I will be able to help you out, hopefully, uh, and if it's really getting into the content on geriatrics or if it's specifically for Dr. Anders, I'll be happy to uh, connect you with Dr. Anders as well. Thank you for your time and happy EMS week.